www.resourcesforintegratedcare.com for more details. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Your microphones will be muted throughout the presentation. However, there will be a question and answer portion at the end of the webinar. So if you do have a question, please click the raise hand feature on your control panel at the designated time and you will be unmuted by an administrator. You can also type your questions into the chat window and an administrator will ask the question out loud during that designated time. There will also be poll questions throughout the presentation. A window will appear with the questions that you can submit your answers at that time. At the conclusion of the webinar, a tab will appear in your browser prompting you to complete the evaluation survey. It is required that you complete this evaluation survey in order to receive three contact hours each from the Michigan Social Work Continuing Education Collaborative, New Hampshire Nurses Association, National Association of Social Workers, and the National Board of Certified Counselors. If you are unable to complete the survey at the end of the webinar, you will receive an email tomorrow with the link to complete the survey at that time if you have not already done so. At this time, I'd like to introduce our instructors to you. Dr. Eileen Triggerhoff is a clinical nurse specialist in a private psychotherapy practice in Western New York and is Director of Program Evaluation at the Buffalo Psychiatric Center in Buffalo, New York. Dr. Triggerhoff has a doctorate in nursing science and is board certified in four areas, as well as being a national and international speaker and consultant on a wide variety of clinical, research, and professional topics. Dr. Trigovov is author, co-author, and contributor to 14 books and dozens of journal articles, and serves on the editorial board of several professional journals. Dr. Trigovov is a partner in an independent research group and provides expert testimony and reports across the country. She is active in community service venues, including clinical settings and family support groups. She also serves as a computer systems and statistical consultant and will open numerous professional nursing organizations. Dr. Daniel Turdevoff is a clinical psychologist who has specialized in psychological assessment, consultation, and treatment of chronic pain syndrome. He has also worked extensively in general psychology as expertise in capacity determination and behavioral treatment planning for developmentally disabled people as well as other patient populations. And we can begin. Yes. Welcome to our uh, third installment, which is uh, treatment interventions for pain problems in people with developmental disabilities. And we are going to be focusing on language here. Yeah, we're going to be focusing on pain management. How can we uh, intervene? to reduce pain symptoms, to reduce uh, their severity, frequency, and very importantly, how can we intervene to reduce uh, related distress because as we could all well imagine, pain produces lots of distress and the distress can feed back and, and result in even more of a pain problem and we would like to intervene in this cycle to uh, interrupt it and improve it. So the outline for today is that we're going to be talking about, of course, the strategies for pain management. And the major categories are behavioral strategies and non-pharmacologic. And we deliberately put those two up front because the pharmacologic strategies, we, we're, we're going to go over in great detail, but the behavioral and non-pharmacologic are much more important. The strategies for pain management with people who have coexisting conditions of developmental disabilities and psychiatric symptoms, whatever those psychiatric symptoms are, and we're going to go over the major categories of major mental illnesses. And again, talk about behavioral, non-pharmacologic, and pharmacologic interventions when you add a psychiatric symptom to the mix. And then we're going to talk about the prevention of chronic pain syndromes, because there is a fair amount that has come out in the research and in our clinical practices about how to prevent that chronic pain syndrome that can be so difficult to manage. And we're going to talk about the documentation of pain management and how you communicate all of this to the rest of the team, to people you provide services for, and their significant others. 
So there are a couple of uh, overall themes in our discussion today of interventions for pain problems um, with people who are developmentally disabled. And uh, we would say in the field of healthcare that everybody, actually whether uh, there is a developmental disability or not, has a right to have their pain effectively treated. And this rests on uh, three uh, uh, considerations. Ethically, we're all bound according to the uh, ethical standards of our own profession to provide adequate uh, pain management uh, treatment for people who are having problems with pain. The second one would be that the clinical effectiveness of any of the other interventions that we're doing with the people with whom we're working is going to be sabotaged if they have an unmanaged or inadequately managed pain problem. And uh, legally, it's in, encoded in various places in the law that the people we work with have a right to have their pain symptoms effectively and adequately managed. So because of the importance of these responsibilities, when we work with people who are having problems with pain, whether developmentally disabled or not, we have to consistently and in an ongoing way ensure that we're adequately addressing pain symptoms. And this is going to involve ongoing efforts of training and learning, staying current in the pain management field. And it also involves uh, effective communication among all of the staff who are working with any particular person, um, all the staff involved with the developmentally disabled patient or with any other patient for that matter are going to have to remain in touch with each other about what's happening with the pain problem, whether something needs to be assessed or reassessed, how is the treatment plan working, what modifications can we make in the treatment plan if we're finding that it's not working as optimally as we would hope. So coping with pain is not something that we are all imbued with when we are born. It's a skill, and just like any other skill, you have to learn how to do that, especially because pain sometimes can descend on somebody and create a problem, a new problem for themselves, and they have to somehow figure out how to do this. So they have to learn a skill, usually at a time when they're at a severe disadvantage for learning, because as we've talked about when we did the neuropathology and also making assessments, when you're in pain, it challenges your cognitive functioning. So we're asking people who have pain, hey, here's something new for you to learn while you're having a problem. So it's a new skill set, and we have to give people some room to absorb something like that, that kind of demand, while they're already challenged in a cognitive and physical way. So some individuals might have advantages in coping with pain. They have high pain thresholds, they, they have something happen to them, and they don't really feel it as acutely. Of course, there are people at the other end of the spectrum where even a very minor pain, like a paper cut, is a major problem. Uh, but let's stick with the advantages. Um, there are people with positive attitudes. All of the research shows, and consistently for many years, that regardless of the source of the pain and regardless of whatever else is going on with that individual, if you have a positive attitude, you're going to do a whole lot better with whatever is tossed your way. And then some people have excellent focus and good control over their thoughts and their feelings. So these people are going to be able to respond better to a cognitive behavioral program. They're going to be able to be, uh, they're going to have an advantage in learning new skills because they have good focus. But the rest of us have to learn how to perform this skill even though there might be a disadvantage. So in learning to cope, any learning process is maximized when the advantages of the individual are capitalized upon. And there are workarounds for any disadvantage that the individual might have. So for example, if we know somebody has a great deal of visual dependence, they have to see something in order to have it absorbed into their cognitive processes, then that's an advantage because there are a lot of visual cues that can be used. But the disadvantage would be that their auditory processing might not be as good. So we're going to do a workaround and depend more on visual cues for that individual so that we can minimize the disadvantage the person has. And of course, we all know that people who have a developmental disability, regardless of what the diagnosis is, can and do learn how to cope with pain.
So we're going to talk uh, in a more extensive way now about behavioral pain management. And uh, that is a particular approach to pain, pain problems, and intervening with pain problems. And it starts with a foundation, as we've been emphasizing in our other presentations to you, that pain is a complex process, an interaction of all of these listed factors, sensation, physiology, cognition, emotions, and behavior. And all of these factors provide possible intervention points to try to work effectively with people who are having pain problems and have developmental disability. So uh, when there is a sensory function or sensory processing function involved in the pain problem, it is sometimes possible to do sensory function training or retraining in a way that can have a positive impact on a pain problem. When physiological factors are involved in pain problems, uh, often things can be done with medication. The other excellent Dr. Trigoloff will be providing greater detail on that. When there are thinking or feeling cognitive or emotional factors involved in pain problems, there are cognitive behavioral interventions. There's providing people with the opportunity for catharsis or talking about their feelings about the pain symptoms. There's use of empathy and extra support that can address those factors. And when there are, there are behavioral factors involved, there um, are behavioral treatment interventions that can be useful. So in this context, what we're talking about with behavioral factors is that we find that pain problems and the way people talk about and complain about pain is affected by the kind of reinforcement that they get. So if a person in some way or other can be many different ways that this can happen, is getting positive reinforcement for the pain symptoms they're complaining of or having a problem with pain. It might be hard to imagine that that could happen, but we're going to go through a number of different ways that actually that can happen, and then there are opportunities to intervene um, in those behavioral processes as well. So general principles of intervening in problem and pain behaviors. We strongly rely on behavioral observations. And we do this because we think from the perspective of behavioral pain management and behavior management in general, that all behavior has a function, including behaviors of complaining of pain or demonstrating pain or crying out. All of those behaviors have a function. And generally, the function is to get something that the person wants more of or to have less of something that the person does not want. In the case of pain, pain behaviors have the function of seeking to get less pain and more relief. And we also think that all behavior is a response to a situation or a circumstance or a set of uh, events or something going on in the person's environment just prior to the time that they engage in the behavior. So we say that there are antecedents to behavior, which means what comes just before the behavior, and that behavior is a response to the antecedent. And we say that there are consequences of the behavior. Um, what is its function? What does this particular behavior get for the person doing the behavior? And in the case of pain, what does the developmentally disabled person get in some way or other when they complain of pain or demonstrate or manifest pain symptoms. Even for self-injurious behavior, a person might be uh, injuring himself, cutting himself or herself, burning themselves, striking their heads against the wall, and so forth. We think that there are antecedents, factors that come just before the self-injurious behavior, that the self-injurious behavior is a response to, and there are things that happen just after the self-injurious behavior, which can give us a hint as to what the function of the self-injurious behavior might be, whether it's getting attention from staff or providing some internal sensations that were felt to be needed at that point. So all behavior is a response to what came before, and all behavior has a function. 
it alters what happens just afterwards in some way that the patient experiences as positively reinforcing. So in order to figure out what is the function of the behavior and what was the behavior a response to, we have to do a behavior analysis. And so we're going to observe very closely the pain complaints and pain-related behaviors of the developmentally disabled people with whom we are working that have a problem with pain. And we're going to ask, what is it a response to? And what function is it serving by observing what happens in the environment? And after making those careful observations, we're going to generate an idea or a hypothesis of how can we intervene with this person that we're working to all help them alter their behavior or acquire skills or cope more adaptively with the pain problem as they might continue to have it. And we would then be designing a plan where the person might be taught skills or help to alter their behavior and we're going to want to give them a lot of reinforcement, praise, attention, um, positive feedback when they're able to engage in the more adaptive behavior in response to pain. And because this is a complicated process, it's frequent that the first time we design the behavior plan, we don't end up designing a plan that looks like it looks when it's fully effective. Or to say this another way, frequently changes are necessary as we try things out in the behavior plan and we see what's working well and what might not be so uh, working well. So we have to expect that we're going to have to modify it and go to plan B and plan C as we observe the results of what we're trying to do with the behavior plan. So as part of a behavioral analysis, we're of course doing a behavioral analysis of pain or of pain behavior. We would like to take a look, how is the pain expressed? Verbally, with words, vocally, with sounds, uh, facial expressions certain kinds of movements or holding the body in a particular way, uh, increased activity, underactivity, uh, physiological responses like irregular breathing or facial flushing, differences in the interactions that a um, person might have with others when he or she is in pain. And we would like to observe furthermore if there is um, any anticipatory behavior prior to the experience of pain. So for example, a developmentally disabled person might be scheduled for a medical procedure or an evaluation procedure and uh, they might experience uh, some discomfort with that procedure and do they start communicating that discomfort even prior to that procedure? Um, or is the person complaining of pain or expressing pain during certain kinds of activities and what are those activities? Uh, is the pain expressed after the activity, is it expressed repeatedly, or chronically, and is it associated with <clears throat> certain psychological or even environmental events like change in circumstances, a fear, a startle response, uh, irritability, or sadness or depression. And again, when we look at these behaviors, these behaviors that communicate pain, we are trying to ask the question, what are these behaviors responding to? What were the antecedents to the behavior? And then from our observations, what are their function? What do they get? What do these communications get for the patient that they might not be currently getting in any other way? Frequently, we're going to be focusing on who pain is experienced with, who's around when the person complains of pain, and where are they or what are they doing when they're experiencing the pain? And you might notice that these are factors E and I, environment and interaction, in the MESIP framework. And that's because we often find that environmental and interactional factors play strong roles in how well a person is doing, whether developmentally disabled or not, and coping with pain. And we might also intervene with environmental and interactional uh, treatment plans that are less intrusive than uh, intervening with a, with a medical 
issue or a psychiatric issue. So it's important. It becomes important to look at the environmental and interactional factors, both because they, they can be all, uh, heavily involved in pain problems and they are less intrusive in some ways to intervene with than some of the other factors. So after we do the behavioral analysis of the person's pain symptoms, we want to develop a plan based on the behavior analysis. And there's some general principles about behavior plans to manage pain. First of all, it has to be doable, workable for all of the involved people the developmentally disabled patient, the staff caregivers, health care providers, other people who have contact with the person all have to understand the behavior plan, be in some kind of agreement with the behavior plan, know how to implement it, and be able and willing and ready and have the time to implement it. Um, there has to be a consistent degree of implementation by everybody involved on an ongoing basis if a pain behavior plan is going to have any chance at all to work. And we also have to have as a part of that behavior plan ongoing monitoring to see how well the plan might work or might not be working. And to give a quick example of a behavior plan of, of this sort, we had a 67-year-old male patient with uh, autism, and he had a problem with shoulder pain and depression. So he was being treated with Cymbalta, which is an antidepressant medication that also has some impact on pain symptoms, and also the pain medication Lyrica on a regular scheduled dose. And this person was in a socialization group that ran from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And we noticed that or we were called in on a consult because it was noticed that his shoulder problem seemed to get a lot worse during the social relation group. He would start complaining that his shoulder hurt, staff had to intervene with him. Um, not, not infrequently, he would have to leave the group to get an assessment of what was going on. So when we looked at this through the MESIP framework, medical, environmental, sensory, interactional, and psychological, and we then did a behavioral pain analysis. What is the behavior a response to? And what is its function? It seemed that he didn't like the socialization group. That wasn't a particularly good experience for him. And the function, in, at least in part, of the complaints of pain during the socialization group were to get out of the socialization group. So as a part of the behavior plan, uh, we had other groups that were running. There was a music listening group that he liked a lot better, so he began to go to the music listening group instead of the socialization group. And we also set up a daily time. Every, every day at 5 o'clock, he talked to a staff member, and he could depend on doing so about what was his pain like that day. So instead of having the feeling that if he didn't complain of pain when it happened, no one would be listening, uh, he had a daily scheduled time to give a report about what was going on with his pain symptoms. And we asked everybody and participated in giving him a lot of positive reinforcement when he was able to stick with that plan and also made sure that he was getting enough staff interaction when he wasn't complaining of pain so that it wasn't the case that the only time that he got any significant staff interaction was when he was complaining of pain. And when all of these uh, interventions were implemented, uh, the frequency of his pain complaints, whether doing uh, the music group or at other points in his day, went way down again, returned to his baseline. So that's a quick example of, of a behavior plan for somebody with autism, depression, and a pain problem. Here are some other sample interventions that, that, that can be put together uh, for a behavior plan. So let's talk about each one. Alteration of accidental positive reinforcement of pain complaints. We listed this first because this happens very frequently, especially in situations where the person is in a treatment facility or some kind of group home 
for developmentally disabled people. Um, sometimes what can happen in a situation like that is that if the person develops a pain problem, what happens when they complain of pain? Staff comes over and does an assessment. So complaining of pain leads to increased staff contact, the receipt of empathy and support, breaks up the day, uh, breaks up the boredom, gets the staff up and moving uh, under the person's control. So all of those things can be positively reinforcing and can happen by accident because as staff members we have to evaluate and assess when somebody complains of pain and we're not actually meaning to positively reinforce the pain complaints or focus on pain, but that can happen. And one of the interventions um, that's helpful in a situation like that involves two things. A, interacting more with the person when they're not in pain, when they're not complaining, so that they don't have to complain of, of pain to get attention, but to get adequate uh, interpersonal stimulation. And then if, if the person complains of pain, we would like to do the pain assessment uh, and, and the medical assessment, let's say, of what's going on with the person at that time in a competent and effective way, but in kind of an emotionally neutral way, uh, not an overly dramatic or hyper-supportive way so that accidental positive reinforcement doesn't come along with the assessment we're doing of the pain problem. Second one on this list is differential positive reinforcement of pain coping behavior. So theoretically, if we have a behavior uh, uh, plan in place for managing pain symptoms, we may be working on improving the person's skill to cope with pain symptoms. And, and that examples of that might be relaxation training, or it might be distraction techniques, or there might be you know, when you let staff uh, know about pain, you do it in a speaking voice rather than shouting, yelling, or screaming. And when we see that the person is following the plan and learning to do those things, we have to be very careful that we positively reinforce the developmentally disabled people that we're working with in that way to do those things. Because it can sometimes happen that in the general principle of the, the squeaky wheel gets, gets the grease, so to speak, when people start coping with their pain uh, more adaptively and more constructively, uh, it can be less attention getting and then staff can move on to uh, spend more time with other people and less time with the person about that problem. And then we fail to differentially positively reinforce their new acquisition of, of adaptive coping skills. So paying attention to, to the kinds of interactions that we have with people who are learning uh, the new, uh, more adaptive coping behaviors, and giving an adequate amount of positive reinforcement for that learning is very important. Now, in the last uh, presentation, we talked about the fact that sometimes even people on regular schedules of medication, not PRN, but scheduled, uh, and sometimes on regular uh, activity schedules, they can develop expectations about when they're going to have pain symptoms. And it can become in a uh, classical conditioning format, kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I expect to feel pain just before I get my pain medication at 3 o'clock, and lo and behold, at 2.45, everything starts to hurt, or the area in question starts to hurt. In that case, it can be helpful to try to provide some additional variety of activity or stimulation during that final interval before the next pain scheduled pain medication dose is given um, a range for some different kinds of stimulation to be going on, distraction, or casually talking with people, and sometimes disrupt the buildup of those expectations. And skills training. Um, the other mysteriously compelling and wonderful Dr. Trigovoff indicated that developmentally disabled people like everybody else can learn and they can learn things like different kinds of relaxation training, um, and they can learn more adaptive ways to cope with pain, more adaptive ways to express it, distraction techniques, uh, altered self-statements, variety of cognitive behavioral uh, techniques can be useful and learn. Um, and one of the things we have to think about when we're trying to do skills training is 
how does the person that we're working with learn best? Because some people learn best when they can have a chance to do a lot of interacting and the learning is like a conversation back and forth and there are questions and answers and other people learn better when it's more of a didactic or a formal a format where they listen to the teacher or the person trying to help them with the skill and, um, and save the questions for the end or, or maybe some people don't even like to ask that many questions but just get the instruction. So we have to think about who are we working with, what is their preferred learning style, how we can figure that out in part by seeing how they've learned other things that they've had to learn and being in the unit or being involved in the treatment program and try to apply that knowledge to, to learning the skills needed to cope with pain more adaptively. So in addition to all of the behavioral pieces that the magnificent wonderful Dr. Trinabot mentioned, uh, we're just going to continue on with non-pharmacological strategies for pain management. And using a behavioral intervention has the opportunity to really work well while it decreases any complications that can happen. You start dumping another chemical into any of us and it can introduce a whole other set of side effects and interactions with other medications, interactions with food, interactions with fluids, time of day, what our normal biological clocks are doing, our normal metabolic systems, our diurnal systems. So sometimes we have to. It's compelling sometimes to just add a medication. But just consider some of the non-pharmacologic strategies and um, what's needed for that. So uh, before instituting a behavioral plan, you have to take a look at, uh, as the other Dr. Trigloff had mentioned, what are the pain causes? And those definitions are potential. So for example, if the person realizes that um, something is going to hurt them, like they're going to have a physical therapy session, or they're going to have their blood drawn, or they're going to have to get up and do some kind of an exercise. And that hurt before. And so the person is going to have a potential pain reaction where they fully expect to have pain for something that hasn't happened and is not happening right now. But they might very well have a potential expectation, uh, an expectation that the pain is going to be there. I'll add to the potential category of Many people who have um, developmental disabilities have had trauma experiences. Many people in the general population have had trauma experiences. The people who have developmental responses, uh, developmental disabilities, regardless of the extent of it, have slightly more uh, trauma rates than people in the general population. And when you've had trauma, the chance of getting triggered is very real. So the potential to have a pain experience is heightened if somebody is traumatized. Then there's the logical category. And everybody has a certain logic that they function with it. So if the person says to themselves, well, this hurt before, it's going to hurt again. And even if that pain only happens intermittently, it reinforces and conditions the individual so that they have a logical system set in place and they're going to have these pain experiences. There are actual pain experiences, I and mean, that doesn't even warrant a great deal of explanation. The person has an ongoing and uh, proven pain experience. But there's also environmental situations for pain that have to be taken into account when you're doing pain management. And we've had this happen a couple of times. You know, somebody would be complaining a great deal about having pain when they were watching TV in the living room of the residence that they're living in. And you know, they're, they're saying they have pain in a particular area, and we have them get up and move and, and into an area where we can talk to them in, in a more quiet situation. And it turns out that there's like a spring busted where they're sitting and they're getting poked right there in that part of their body. So the very complex and highly uh, sophisticated fix that these consultants put into place is, you know, to place the cushion on the couch. So take a look at some of the environmental factors that can be going on. Sometimes you, you, you would not necessarily know there's an environmental feature going on because you don't have the situation that the person has. Let's say somebody has some cervical or even lower back disc problems, like the disc is bulging or they have uh, some twisting going on in the, the vertebral column. And if a cold draft hits them, 
they're going to go into a muscle spasm. And a cold draft might not be a problem. As a matter of fact, it might be very refreshing to most people. But this individual could have a great deal of pain as a result of an environmental feature. So some non-pharmacological strategies for dealing with these pain situations. Uh, first of all would be a comfort box, comfort bag, comfort cart. Uh, just in general, the theme is you're trying to establish a pathway for the individual to reach that they can go get something that's going to be comfortable for them. So in that comfort box, for example, might be something that addresses their sensory issues. Uh, very recently, and I think we mentioned this in the assessment piece, we noticed that a, a 32-year-old woman who had Down syndrome was very attractive to a microfiber scarf that somebody, one of the staff members had on, and she was touching it and, and, and getting a great deal of calming out of that. So into her comfort box went a microfiber piece of material. So anything that the person can really enjoy or be distracted by or be interested in that can help them deal with their pain should go in their comfort box. And everybody has something a little different along those lines. Um, sensory experiences, some people are, they, they really need to have some tactile experiences. So for example, you just take one of those plastic grocery store garbage bags and you crumple up newspapers and stick stuff them in there, tie a knot in the bag, and they can just toss it from one hand to the next. And if they drop it because they don't have good dexterity, it's no big deal, it's not going to break anything because it's light. And it also if they drop it, it's not going to go rolling under a couch or a table where the person has to go seeking it. It's just going to lay there and plop. So those kinds of sensory experiences can be good. Stroking something that's uh, pleasant for them feels good. Um, but I'll also put in the sensory experiences that sometimes people are tactically oversensitive, hypersensitive, and they really can't have something like massage, that that might be too distressing for them. But they can do some self-massage, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Anything that's going to distract them from their pain, their favorite musical, uh, music, listening to music. Um, we have somebody who very much likes it's a name, because it's a rap group, and I'm not big into that. I forgot. But anyway, it, it, when she's having a hard time, she knows to turn on that particular group's music, because it really helps her. The rhythm distracts her, and it helps her to focus on managing her pain. And then biofeedback, which is a highly effective method, where you can teach people at very many levels of intellectual ability and disability to change their physiological experiences. So um, a behavioral plan can contain components depending on the person's tactile sensitivities and their tolerance levels. Some pain is very responsive to ice. Some pain is very responsive to heat. The same exact pain can be heat and ice res you know, responsive at different times. So you have to have some options available. Acupuncture, not quite as often do we use acupuncture, but acupressure can be very helpful. And, uh, and I'll roll this into the massage as well. There are a lot of uh, people who have developmental disabilities have luxury funds. And with those luxury funds, you can get a massage therapist who is specializing in people who have developmental disabilities to come in and do special massage. But if somebody is hypersensitive, they certainly might not want somebody else to massage them. But it doesn't have to be a full massage. We have one massage therapist we work with who teaches people how to do self-massage, especially when people are stressed. Having this web between the thumb and index fingers, just very gently increasing the pressure and then decreasing while you're rubbing in a small circle, that somebody can do to themselves as much as they can tolerate. And so the massage therapist can sit next to them and teach them some things about it. But there's also something called a theracane. And it's a cane. It's shaped. It has a big kind of crook to it. And it has knobs that stick out of it. It's not expensive. I think it's like $15 or something like that. And the individual can do it themselves or somebody can do it for them. And it, it identifies the trigger points, or when we're especially stressed, we call them trigger boss points. Uh, where the tension and the calcification actually accumulate and you get a lump in the muscles. 
and the muscle fibers are supposed to glide along each other, but when you have this spasm or some calcification or even lactic acid builds up in the muscle fibers, it causes a little bit of a jam up in the process, and the muscle fibers don't glide, they kind of jam up and, and snag on each other. And if you have this theracane, you can give yourself a massage right where that uh, trigger block point is and uh, work it out so that the muscle is less uh, painful. Uh, there's ultrasound. Usually a physical therapist will do this. And it's a wand. It's not very big. It's not, not very scary. Where there is an increase of very small vibrations that can increase the heat in the area. And that increases the circulation to the area, which promotes healing. But it also creates some relaxation of the muscle fibers because cold tends to slow them down, and heat tends to move them around a little bit. So it's almost like giving uh, an internal massage. You're using the ultrasound to create some heat that can do that. And that, that can be very pretty helpful for people. Um, the TENS, which is a uh, electrical nerve stimulator, usually have four pads, um, conductor pads, and it's attached by a wire to a little uh, pack that, where you set the settings and you increase it just so that the person starts to feel the pulse. And you can wear that for an hour, you can wear it for 10 hours. Usually an hour is a good way to get it going. And it actually interrupts some of the pain signals that are going on, and it's not a medication. And the only trouble we've noticed with the TENS is that the pads that they come, the standard pads that they come with, can have some skin reactions. People can be sensitive to the gum to the, that. And you would know that if you put a Band-Aid on them and they got a little irritated. So they have hypoallergenic uh, sensor pads. That's very good. A vibration, usually from a uh, massager, and cushioning and splinting, putting a cushion, let's say somebody has lower back pain. When they're sleeping, you can have a pillow in between their knees, or there's pillows that have um, almost like a a bandage kind of thing, but it's like a sock all the way around it. And you glide it up the leg, and it just stays there in between the knees. So if you roll over, it doesn't fall out. and You have to go searching for it, and it disrupts your sleep. So that's uh, another way to deal with the pain. Breathing exercises, teaching people how to breathe properly. We usually know how to breathe in and out. But to breathe properly as pain management is to breathe in to the count of four at the very minimum. Eight would be better. And when you breathe in, your stomach goes out. And then to hold it for a count of four or a count of eight, build up to it. And then to exhale as if you are squeezing toothpaste up a tube so that your stomach is going to go in as you're exhaling. And those breathing exercises can be very calming. They can be very helpful in, in people who have pain problems. Visualization, guided imagery. It has to be a certain amount of cognitive power in order to do that, but we have found it very successful in a number of circumstances. People can do it in a group setting. We've done that a number of times where everybody imagines a certain scene. We check ahead of time to make sure the scene is not disturbing to anybody for any triggering purposes. Art and journaling, there should be a comma there. Art and journaling are both good ways of distracting from pain, but also getting an expression of the pain in a different mode. So having somebody use a great deal of orange or a great deal of red when they're drawing and trying to express where their pain is coming from, especially if they're not very verbal or they are selectively mute for the time being. Now we get to meds. Uh, the pharmacologic interventions for people who have uh, developmental disabilities and they also have pain is, let's talk about non-opioids opioids first, because there are options for pain management that do not include opioid medications. There are issues with the opioids. There are antidepressants. Very frequently we know that people have depressive reactions that amplify pain sensations. So that is something you need to keep in mind. So if the person has depression, whatever pain they had is going to feel worse to them. And also antidepressants can be effective in tamping down those pain reactions. So there are some antidepressants. Not all of them will do it, but you're going to be looking at things like Cymbalta, which is it's 
originally, well, for about 17 years, it was indicated as purely a neuropathic pain medication. And then about eight or nine years ago, it was also given the indication of an antidepressant. So that's certainly along those lines. But things like Paxil, Paxil is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, an SSRI. And it, Paxil, calming. It's an anti-anxiety antidepressant. And sometimes the anxiety, as well as the depression, can heighten pain sensations. And if you lower both of those features, you're going to have less pain. There are anticonvulsants, just selected anticonvulsants, that may decrease neurologic hypersensitivity that some pain messages are composed of. So things like Neurotin. Uh, the, the generic name for Neurotin is gabapentin. And GABA is one of the neurotransmitters that we deal with a lot for anxiety and for pain. And it has specific features. So for example, if I was going to give somebody gabapentin, Neurotin, for uh, a seizure disorder, I might have them on 1,200, 1,400, or 1,600 milligrams a day. But if I'm going to give them neurotin for pain management, I might give them 2,400, 2,600 milligrams. So it's a much higher dose. And there are, of course, consequences of that. The person is probably going to be sedated. But it can manage their pain. And the interesting feature that we have been told when people take neurotin for pain management is that it doesn't make the pain go away. It makes the pain go over there. So it's not quite as in, the, in the center of their awareness. It's there, but it's more manageable. They tend not to care so much about it. Anti-anxiety medications are, of course, they come in two main groups, benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepines. And as I mentioned before, Lowering somebody's anxiety can also address their pain experiences. We would prefer non-benzodiazepines and prefer that they be given on a regular basis and not as a PRN basis. But if you have to give benzodiazepines because their anxiety is so routinized, then it should be a regular pain medication schedule. It should not be a PRN schedule. And, it, and that can have some effect for lowering somebody's pain. Muscle relaxants can be good, especially if your pain is caused by muscle spasms. So there are muscle relaxants like Flexeril and Baclofen, and I mean, there's, there's many uh, anti-muscle <coughs> anti spasm medications and what they can do. And then there's over-the-counter non-opioid medications. Aspirin, which you've got to be careful. Some people are either allergic or they're sensitive to aspirin, or they tend towards bleeding, which is something you don't want them to do. Um, ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory, which is good. But sometimes people get a lot of uncomfortable side effects from ibuprofen, and some people just don't respond to it at all. It just does not work for them. But if you can cut down on the inflammation, and that's the source of the pain, then that's a good way of handling it without going to the opioids. Uh, acetaminophen, you know, the Tylenol group, anything along those over-the-counter areas that can be a medication for you. So let's talk about the opioids. They're not to be dismissed for this population, even though they have disadvantages. Um, and as we mentioned with many of these medications, they really should be scheduled. They should not be PRN administration. So think about when you're giving the medication and if it's on a regular schedule. You might want to vary that schedule from time to time, but doing a PRN pain med uh, is usually not a good idea. Uh, consider patient-controlled uh, patient analgesia, PCA. Um, and you have to put that together with a monitoring to see if there is an effectiveness. And that would only be after some kind of a surgical procedure or some procedure like that. The difficulties with opioids are only a little bit more complex than the difficulties it would be for the general population. Substance dependence is a much bigger problem of people who have developmental disabilities than people who don't. But everybody has an issue with opioids. Everybody is vulnerable to having dependence on the substance. And the problem is you can take a, a little bit of extra of your opioids, and it can cause a great number of problems. Constipation, all the opioids cause a slowing down of gastrointestinal systems, and so it's going to slow down peristalsis, which means the person is going to become constipated as a result of the medication. If they're already constipated, 
because they're taking 16 other medications that constipate them, or they just have, like for example, Down syndrome, they tend to have much more constipation than people in the general population. The opioids are going to make it worse, and you have to stay right on top of that. You have to make sure that they're well hydrated, you have, and, and well hydrated with water, just water. It's uh, not, <laughs> I know I can be very vague about things, but hydrating with something that has other things in it, like hydrating with crystal light, or hydrating with coffee, or hydrating with tea, or soda, those other components actually take up a lot of energy. So whatever fluid, whatever water you're getting into you is challenging your metabolism to try to metabolize all that extra stuff that's going on. And just in general, people who have developmental disabilities shouldn't be drinking a lot of soda, anything that's carbonated, because it increases osteoporosis, anything with carbonation is. Anybody in the general population over the age of 50 shouldn't be having a lot of carbonation because it promotes osteoporosis. And a lot of medications that people are on who have developmental disabilities usually have that as a side effect. So you don't want to double up on that. So watch the constipation and include water, just water, maybe a little lime juice or lemon juice, but really not a whole lot of components to it to enhance that gastrointestinal uh, metabolism. Respiratory depression, side effect of all opioids, slows down the breathing. So you don't want to have a whole lot of slowed respiratory rate in people who have developmental disabilities because they have a lot of respiratory vulnerability. And you don't want to have their breathing go down even lower because they're more likely to get pneumonias, they're more likely to get upper respiratory infections. The potential for overdose is very high, especially if the person has their opioids in hand. They're going to forget that they took it or if they feel better after they took one, they're going to well, I might feel a whole lot better after I take four. Uh, so the, the potential for overdose is very dangerous. And the tolerance, everybody develops a tolerance to an opioid. Everybody develops a tolerance to a benzodiazepine. Tolerance means you're going to need more over time. And more means more constipation, more respiratory depression, and the risk that the person could overdose. The um, pain sources needs to be kept in mind when you're trying to manage any kind of pain. Like where does the pain come from? If it's acute, if it's procedural, if they just got post-operative, you know, they just had a surgical procedure of some kind, that pain is sometimes easier to treat because we know exactly where it's coming from, we know why it's there, we know generally what's going to help it and how long it's going to last. Unfortunately, we don't get that very often. Um, shorter term treat treatment usually minimizes the consequences of pharmacologic treatment. So, so the person's not going to be on those opioids or any other medication for a long period of time. They're going to get off of it. The chronic pain is much less predictable. And the source is difficult to localize. You might not know where the pain comes from. Several pain conditions, several physical conditions that cause pain have referred pain. So you might have somebody who has pain here, and what's really going on is that they have a sinus infection, but it's going to affect their teeth, their jaw, their bite. You might have somebody who has a great deal of pain behind their scapula, behind their shoulder blade, and what's going on is they have a kidney infection or a kidney stone or an ectopic pregnancy or an ovarian cyst. And the pain is referred to different parts of the body. But it's on a chronic basis, it's much less predictable. If somebody has muscle spasms, if somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, or if they have late stage osteoporosis. So the long term nature of what we have to do with giving medication, along with the unlikely full resolution of the pain, we're not probably going to make the pain go away, makes the consequences of what's going on with their medication much more dire. And I'd like to throw in two additional uh, considerations about um, medications and uh, medical measures for pain management. One is that, particularly when we're working with older developmentally disabled patients, um, many times there can be a very slight increase in bacteria in the urinary tract, and you do a, a, a lab, and it doesn't technically classify as a urinary tract infection. 
but it may be running at the high end of what's regarded to be the normal range. And our, our experience, um, older patients, whether developmentally disabled or not, who, who that uh, happens to, become vulnerable to a wide variety of disturbances, including uh, psychiatric, uh, emotional, and also increased pain symptoms. So as part of the uh, M in MESIP, when there is uh, increased pain, and particularly if the person has had a prior history of uh, urinary tract infection problems or running by counts of bacteria, even within the normal range in a, in a urinary uh, tract lab, it's worth it to, you know, to look into that as a possible contributor. And I'll jump in for that. So go ahead. Uh, when you do get a, a urine, you know, get a urinalysis back and it says that it is negative, that for this population doesn't really tell us everything that we need to know. It doesn't have to be colonized in terms of bacterial level to be challenging to that individual because they have so many problems and, and their systems are not robust enough. So take a very good look when you're doing a urinalysis and if the lab result comes back as negative, you need a little bit more detail and you might want to pay more attention to that. And the other uh, um, thing that we'll throw in here, I guess, uh, going back to the use of uh, Neurontin, Agabapentin, sometimes people are prescribed certain doses of Neurontin for pain management, and uh, we see perhaps that it's not as effective as, as we would hope it would be. And there is a lab test that can give the level for Neurontin, just like you might get the level for other anti-seizure medications. You can get it for a lab, from a lab test for Neurontin level, Gabapentin level. It's kind of an expensive test, so facilities often don't like to order it much. They're not crazy about it. And there really isn't a wide body of literature that directly relates, on the one hand, experienced pain to, on the other hand, exact levels, lab levels of Gabapentin. However, um, it seems reasonable to think that if we're working with somebody and they're taking Neurontin for pain management and somehow the Neurontin prescription doesn't seem to be uh, doing very much and we went and we got a lab level and it was pretty low, that might be an empirical argument to try an increased dose of, of that medication if medically feasible. On the other hand, um, if, we were, if, so, if, if we had a person taking Neurontin wasn't seeming to do much and we did the lab and the level was uh, closer to the normal range or in the normal range, that's probably uh, more likely that that might not be the effective pain management medication for that particular person. So it's a bit of an expensive lab test, but if you're in a situation where neurotin is being um, prescribed for pain management, it, it might add some information to help uh, the prescriber uh, make make a more effective choice. Yeah, we have a lot of information now, much more information than we had even 10 years ago, that some people are rapid metabolizers, some people are slow metabolizers, and that there are genetic determinants to this, and the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. I mean, there's some fascinating publications, if I must say so myself. They are fascinating. Uh, about uh, how these medications are being metabolized by individuals and what does it mean in the larger picture. So if you have, uh, if, if you get, for example, the gabapentin level and you see that it's very low but they're taking what should be a therapeutic dose, then you know that that person is a rapid metabolizer and they probably very safely can have a much higher dose, that, higher than might even be indicated because we're going by clinical reality and not just a standardized test for everybody in the country kind of broken down. So, uh, you know, take a look at some of these levels and look at the clinical situation and see if the clinical picture matches what's going on with the laboratory picture. And you might have a little bit more leeway that way, at least your prescribers will. And all the information that you document about how their pain is being responsive or non-responsive to Neurontin or to any other pain medication is priceless. And we talked about that in module two about assessment. But, uh, you know, every clinician has something priceless to add to the uh, treatment of, of pain in general. 
I'll also throw in a third consideration, which is that many of the medications that we use, whether they're for pain management or for treatment of psychological or psychiatric uh, problems, have expectable side effects. And when possible, uh, it's a good idea to try to use those side effects in a therapeutic manner. So for example, if we have a developmentally disabled person that has a pain problem and also a problem with depression, and maybe they've been prescribed the antidepressant Remeron, maybe they're having appetite problems in Remeron. As a result of the depression, they're having appetite problems in Remeron. It's often a good one to help a person maintain their weight level or gain back some of the weight they've lost. Many times when people take Remeron, they get tired. And if we're working with somebody whose pain symptoms are keeping them awake or not at night, or their depression is making it more difficult for them to sleep, or both, it could be a good idea to schedule that dose of Remeron right at bedtime. So in that case, we're, we're trying to use the side effect of fatigue with Remeron, if medically feasible, for example, to help address the person's problem with sleep. So it's, worth, it's worthwhile if we're working with somebody that has a pain problem and maybe other problems where there's a range of medications being prescribed, to think about what are the expectable side effects of these medications and how can we how can we think about dose scheduling, time of day, frequency, and so forth, if possible, to use some of those side effects in a therapeutic manner? Yeah, we like using side effects uh, competently. Sometimes people have unusual side effect reactions, but when it's predictable, we like to make use of it. And as a side effect of the 14 cups of coffee we drank <laughs> this morning, we seem to have gotten to the break a little early, rushing through our material, so we'll take a... Uh, 10 minute breaks and um, 